day three of a busy week, and uh, hopefully you'll find this useful. How many of you here are actually using Kubernetes today? Okay, almost all of you, good. Um, so I'm not proposing to describe what Kubernetes is today, but I am going to be talking a bit about how permissions work, uh, and basically the idea is to compare how Kubernetes grants you com permissions compared with how it's done in Linux. I work for a company called Aqua Security. We have a container security platform that helps enterprises secure their container deployments on Kubernetes or, or under other orchestrators. Um, I have, well, last year I was co chair for uh, KubeCon and Cloud Native Con. Um, I've co authored a book about Kubernetes security, and uh, I'm currently the chair of the CNCF's. Technical Oversight Committee. So I don't know everything, but I do know a few things about Kubernetes and, and security in particular. So as I say, the idea for this morning is to start with something that we're probably more familiar with, permissions on Linux, and use that to kind of explore how permissions work in Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes is more complicated. Sometimes it's been described as a distributed operating system. And if we take a, a, a single host operating system and a distributed operating system, I think we can be pretty sure that the distributed version is going to have more complexity in it. But we'll try and break things down by starting with the sort of simple things. So you're probably pretty familiar with seeing things like this, using ls on the command line in Linux to see the attributes of a file and the permissions for that file. Every file has an owner, and it's associated with a group. And there are permissions bits which describe who can do what to that file. We have three groups of these permissions for the file owner, for the group, and for everybody else. And in each of those groups, we've got a bit that says, can you read, can you write, and can you execute? So in this example, the read bit is set for all three. So anybody on, who can get into the machine can read this particular file. Only uh, the owner of the file, called Liz, has the write bit set. So Liz is the only person who can write to this file. And any user who's in the group staff, because that group is associated with the file, and the X bit is set for the group as well as the owner. So anyone who's a member of that group could run, they have permission to run this file. To sort of note here, there's a user who is doing something. They're reading, they're writing, or they're executing. And that action they're taking, the verb they're doing, may or may not be permitted, depending on who the user is, what group they're in, and which file it is they're trying to do it to. So everything we need to know about whether a user can perform an action on a file is encapsulated in attributes of the file. The file exists, and as part of its existence, as part of the file itself, there's a definition of its permissions and the owner information and the group information. So they're all kind of combined into one entity. But as we'll see in Kubernetes, things are separated out into different abstractions. But let's have a look at what the correspondence is. What I'd really like to do is say, if we have these things like a file and the file owner and the file permissions on Linux, what's the corresponding equivalent in Kubernetes? So in Linux, have you heard this expression that everything is a file? Um, it's kind of not quite true because there are also processes, but basically everything in Linux exists as something that looks like a file or has a file descriptor. In Kubernetes, we don't really have that. What we have is resources. We have lots of different types of objects, like pods, or nodes, or service accounts, or um, pod security policies, or custom resources. 
There are lots and lots and lots of different types of resources. But every thing that we're going to deal with, every first-class type of entity in Kubernetes, is a resource. So I'm going to say if everything is a file in Linux and everything is a resource in Kubernetes, we'll, we'll say that they're kind of equivalent. To take that into a more concrete example, in Linux, if you want to run an application called MyApp, you run a file called MyApp. In Kubernetes, you'd have to create a pod, which is a type of resource, in order to run that application. It's a, you know, I'm stretching the, the definition a bit here, but th we can say there's some equivalence here. But in Kubernetes, resources don't have owners. They don't have permissions information associated with it. We have to go to some different objects and some different abstractions to find the equivalence of that owner and the permissions bits. And those abstractions are defined by what we call role-based access control in Kubernetes. In the past, there were other forms of uh, access control, ABAC. RBAC is the way to go. If you're still using ABAC, you should move on to role-based access control. And the key to this is in the first word, roles. What do we mean by a role? So here's a YAML definition of role, because you know what is a presentation without some YAML? Um, and you can see that the thing that the role is uh, defining, what this YAML includes, is a set of rules. And the rules say which verbs you're allowed to perform on which set of resources. It doesn't say anything about who can do it. It's just saying what actions you can take on what objects. This is actually kind of similar to what we had in Linux, right? We, we had a set of verbs. We only had three verbs. And we only have one type of resource. We have files. But this is what permissions are about, right? They're saying who can perform actions on a particular object. In Linux, we're always looking at one particular named file, whereas in Kubernetes, we can define those roles to cover a whole class of objects. We also have a lot more verbs in Kubernetes. So um, the kind of read-only verbs like getting or listing or watching, uh, the writing type things like creating or deleting. Execute, arguably, it doesn't really exist. We just create or update or delete things in Kubernetes. And then there are some sort of very resource-specific verbs. Not only can you define your own custom resources, you could define your own verbs that could act on those resources. So in Kubernetes, roles and the verbs they define are kind of much more complex. There are many more options for these verbs. We're talking here about uh, defining a role that says which resources you can act on. And it could be a group of resources, like all the pods. Or it could be a specific named resources. We could define a role that relates just to a particular resource, a pod called MyApp. Having got those roles, we get to the access control part, the bit that says who can take these actions. And who, when we talk about who, we're normally talking about a user, right? So if we have a user and we have a, a role, a set of rules, the thing that kind of associates the two things together is a role binding. So the role binding says this user can do the verbs on the resources as defined in this role. So it links the two things together. It's not necessarily just a user. It's, really, it's called a subject. And the user could actually be a, a group as well as a user. You see the, the kind of bottom half of the um, definition here. It's a subject. And in this instance, the kind of subject is a user. But you can see it's really just associating a role and a subject. So if it wasn't a user, what else could it be? Well, it could be a group. 
Much like we have groups in Linux, we can have groups in Kubernetes. But these things are not actually first-class objects in Kubernetes. There's no such thing as an, a user object in Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes expects that your users and your groups are defined somewhere else. You know, maybe you have a, an enterprise LDAP directory that defines all the users and groups. And you don't want to duplicate that information. You want to be able to refer to that from your Kubernetes uh, cluster. So when we define a, a role binding and we're referring to a user or a group, Kubernetes is basically just going to take your word for it that that exists. There's a third type of, of subject, and that's called service accounts. And service accounts are, they are first class uh, objects inside Kubernetes. And they're identities, they're kind of like users, but they're really used for applications to run under. So every time you're running a pod in Kubernetes, it's running under a service account. And the idea of these service accounts is that you can have different identities for different applications so that you can give them different uh, permissions through different role bindings. And we'll see some examples of that shortly. Roles are namespaced. So there are lots of different ways you can organize your, um, your namespaces. But the fact that they are namespaced means you can define a role and it only applies in a particular namespace. But if you want to define roles and role bindings that apply to everything across the whole cluster, there's an equivalent called cluster roles and cluster role bindings. Everything that I say about role bindings kind of applies to cluster roles as well. OK, so we've got our role binding. It's associating a role and some subjects. And that role is referring to a resource or maybe a group of resources. And that is kind of a picture of how permissions get defined in Kubernetes. And if we compare that to the Linux version, it's quite a lot more complicated. So Linux, everything was in one object. Kubernetes, we've got all these different abstractions. So if you've ever been thinking, oh, this RBAC thing is quite difficult to get your head around, this is a representation of why it's, diff you know, it's, it's just more complicated. OK, so the problem with complexity is what you can call entropy. So if you cast your mind back to uh, physics classes in school, um, you might recall the second law of thermodynamics, which says that uh, a, a system will tend to a state of maximum entropy, kind of maximum randomness, if you like. That's kind of the state of thermodynamic equilibrium in any system. And I say the same thing is true with RBAC definitions. The entropy of permissions will always tend to increase over time. And what do I mean by that? Well, we start with a lot of cluster role bindings right from the get-go. As soon as you install Kubernetes, if you're using a standard installer, it will create a whole load of cluster role bindings. And these are there for the, mostly for the system code to run under. So for example, there's a whole bunch of um, roles and role bindings associated with um, controllers. Um, we could actually look at them on a live system. Uh, get, uh, let's get all the cluster roles in all the namespaces. And this is just like um, Kubernetes on Docker on my Mac. And there's a whole load of them. And we can see pretty much every controller has its own cluster role binding. So it's already pretty complicated before you start making any definitions of any roles and role bindings of your own. Now, ideally, you want every role and role binding to be as small as possible to grant the fewest permissions possible. This is a security principle called least privilege. 
You basically only want to give out privileges that something needs in order to do its job. But suppose you're a cluster admin, and people keep coming to you, and they keep saying, oh, you know, a new person's joined the team, and, and we need to give them permission to list all the pods. It would be very tempting to go and create a rule that says, you know what, just everyone, everyone can get pods. And then people come back and they say, oh, you know, um, it's really annoying. Every time I want to create a pod, I have to come to you and ask for like a new role binding. And the admin might be tempted to say, you know what, just have, have all the verbs. You can do whatever you like to, to pods. So it's kind of human nature that we will tend to make things easy for ourselves. We tend to grant ourselves additional permissions. And it's kind of avoid, it's missing the point of our back. The, the idea with our back is that you can have these really granular, really closely defined sets of permissions. So we've got to fight this tendency to scope things widely. The other problem is that um, these permissions, they're, they're like a whitelist, if you like. There's no blacklisting. So if any role and role binding combination gives you permission to do something, you have that permission. So there could be you know, a thousand different roles and role bindings, and only one of them needs to grant access to a particular resource, and the subject in that role binding has that permission. They, they all add up. So we have this tendency over time that more subjects are going to be able to do more things on the system. They will have more permissions. And unfortunately, that gives us a greater likelihood that one of those subjects is either malicious, you know, maybe it's a bad user in your organization, maybe it's just foolishness, somebody can make mistakes, and, and the more permissions they have, the more harmful those mistakes could be. Or it could be about compromised applications. So suppose you're running an application in a pod in Kubernetes. And I mentioned before, your application is associated with a service account. And by default, the token that allows the service account to identify itself is made accessible to the application code in the pod. And the idea of this is that if your application code needs to be able to communicate with the Kubernetes API, it can do that, and it can use the identity of whatever service account it's running under to, to do that, to have permission to access the Kubernetes API. Now, just suppose that you happen to be running some kind of vulnerable code. Like, unfortunately, it is true that vulnerabilities exist, flaws exist in software that allow hackers to exploit that software. Um, vulnerability scanning is what you do to try to eliminate those vulnerabilities from your applications. But the unfortunate truth is I am guessing that one of you in this room is unknowingly in your cluster running something with a vulnerability. It's probably quite likely. And if you have a vulnerability, it's possible that somebody will be able to compromise your application. And having compromised your application, they can get in and run software that they want to run inside your pod and possibly access that token. So um, let me show you this in, in real life rather than just showing you the, um, the YAML. Well, I'll start by showing you some YAML. So uh, I have a definition called superpower, which creates a service account called superpower. And I'm going to give this service account, I'm going to bind it to the cluster admin role. So the cluster admin role has permission to do all verbs to all resources. And it's a cluster role, so it's across the whole, uh, the whole cluster. So let's just apply that. OK. And I'm also going to run, uh, let's, right, I have a pod definition here, this uh, image that I'm going to run, it, it's basically just uh, an Ubuntu image. I think it's Ubuntu it's based on. And it's got curl installed so that I can easily make network requests. 
and it sleeps for a very long time just so that it doesn't terminate, so I have time to get in and do my demo. And it's running under that superpower account that has permission to do kind of anything. So let's run that. Uh, curl. And we'll just make sure it's up and running. It is up and running. So now I'm going to exec into it. And this is simulating the idea that I'm a hacker who has managed to open a reverse shell into your application. OK. Now, having done that, I can get hold of the token that's associated with that service account. Uh, and I'm just going to store that in an environment variable. Uh, cat, and it just exists in var run secrets. Kubernetes service account token. And there will always be a service account token unless you explicitly turn it off. Right? You can define not mounting the token. But by default, it's going to be there. It might be the default service account. In my case, it's that superpower service account. Right. So I want to let's see what happens if I try to issue requests against the Kubernetes API. And to start with, I'm going to do it with no identity. I'm going to make an anonymous request. And uh, I can just refer to Kubernetes, and we'll try and look at, let's try and look at namespaces. And we get a 403 error. It's, we're not permitted as an anonymous user, because I didn't specify any identity, to make that particular API request. But if I do the same thing and I pass in uh, an authorization header, if I can spell it, uh, bearer token. So I'm going to use that token that I read out of the, the file, out of the mounted file before. And this time, I can get information. So as an attacker, I can very, very trivially use whatever identity your application code is running under. If, as in this case, as superpowers, I, uh, can, I can do anything I like. I can get pod information. I, can, I could create pods if I wanted to. The point of showing you this is to try to emphasize you want your service accounts to have least privileges. You only want to let um, software have access to the API if it needs it. And most of the time, your application code does not need the ability to manipulate your Kubernetes API. So how can you check that? As an administrator, how can you know whether your service accounts, whether your users, whether your groups have been given too widely scoped a set of permissions? It's not super easy. What you want to know is, can well, the first question you might ask is, can a particular identity do a particular action on a particular type of resources? And in Linux, we can do that very easily just by looking at the attributes of the file. And if we want to find out whether a particular user can, let's say, execute this file, all we need to know is, is that user either Liz or a member of the st uh, staff group? And we could do that simply by looking up the identity. So it's a very, very simple question. Can a person do a verb, do a thing on a particular file in Linux? Very easy to answer. In Kubernetes, it's more complicated because we have all these extra abstractions. So we have to start from the user definition. We have to find all the role bindings that refer to that user, to that subject. And then we have to find all of the roles that those role bindings reference. And they don't have to be a one-to-one -one mapping, by the way. I, the examples I showed you do have a one-to-one -one mapping, and that's quite a nice practice for keeping it easy to, to manage. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And then if any of those roles allow that particular action to be taken on that type of resource, then that user can do it. 
So you have to ask a few different questions to answer that question. Can I, for example, create a pod? And there is a tool that allows you to ask that question. Cube control auth, can I? Uh, so we can just try that. I'll quit out of that. I could say cube control auth, can I um, create pods? And yes, I can. And could I do it as a different user? I think I might have a user, Alice. So Alice can't create pods. Okay. Same thing. A more interesting question in terms of trying to reduce the entropy problem is finding out all the people who can perform a particular action on a set of resources, all the people who can create pods, all the people who can delete nodes. When I say people, I also mean service accounts. To answer that question, we kind of have to chain through those, these different objects in, in the other order. Right? So we have to find all of the roles that would allow, let's say, creating pods. And every one of those roles, we've got to find all of the right role bindings that reference those roles. And then we have to find all of the subjects that they refer to. We, uh, we just recently wrote, uh, it's open source, uh, a proof of concept of a tool that can answer that question. Uh, so at the moment, it's called Cube Control Who Can. And let me show you that one. So Cube Control. I can spell it. I can't spell it. I can spell it. Who can create pods? And in this instance, we don't have any role bindings, but we do have quite a lot of cluster role bindings that allow for creating pods in this particular example. So hopefully that will be a useful new tool that we're going to try and get this added as an extension into Cube Control over the next few weeks. But yeah, the idea is that you can find all of the role bindings and all of the cluster role bindings that are associated with the permission you're looking for. And you can get a list of all of the subjects that can do the thing that you're interested in. So you could use this to find out who in your organization has permission to Delete nodes, I don't know, something bad. <laughs> All right. So to just kind of go back to that table of, of comparisons, we saw that you know, files maybe are kind of equivalent to resources, and that we have verbs that you can, you know, actions that you can take on resources, but there are many, many more of them in Kubernetes. We've got these different abstractions in Kubernetes that make it slightly more complicated to figure out who can do what. And we also have the difference that um, users and groups are first-class things in a Linux system, but in Kubernetes, they're expected to be defined somewhere else. I don't know if you've heard this quote, the idea that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than uh, permission. Um, I think it arguably is a better idea to configure your permissions up front and get them right and follow the principle of least privilege than it would be to ask your boss for forgiveness if you get attacked. All right, if you want to find out more about Kubernetes security, that book that I uh, referred to earlier that I, I, I co wrote it with uh, Michael Hausenblas from AWS, and you can actually get a copy of that for free electronically from that URL for the mere cost of your email address, you know, contact details. And I think with that, we can take questions, if there are any questions from the app. Yeah. <laughs>